I'm Heidi Zuckerman. I'm the Nancy and Bob Real CEO and Director here at the Aspen Art Museum. And some of you were here with us last night when we had the show about a fashion presentation. And if you were here, you'll know that everyone was turned and facing the other way. So I love how adaptable the space is and the building is and all the different things that we can do in it. So thank you for joining us tonight. This is the first of our summer artist talks. And it is graciously supported by the Question of Education Fund. And I hope you will join us later this summer for talks by Anne Kibidi, Albert Helen Cruz Vegas, and our Aspen Award for Art honoree, Sheet Johnson. Tonight, we, we welcome Nikki and Simon Haas, who have a close connection to Aspen and the Aspen Art Museum. Their collaborative projects exist at the intersection of art and design, and they often incorporate nature, fantasy, psychedelia and humor. Their work is currently on view at Boski West, just down the street. I was there earlier today. And it's the subject of an upcoming survey at the Vast Museum of Art uh, with my friend Sylvia. Right. So for tonight's program, they're going to start by showing some slides. And uh, then I'll ask them some questions. And then you guys can ask them some questions. And we'll just have a dialogue about art. So looking forward to it. Thanks. Thanks, Heidi. Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I'm gonna roll through the slides and tell you a little bit about our work. Uh, this first slide is of a collection we did called Afriques. This is uh, an entirely beaded collection. So every bead is very, very small. Uh, it's thousands and thousands of beads on each piece. Um, and it was the result of us traveling to South Africa, seeing the beadwork there, and being completely enthralled with it. Um, and we met a, a group of women there who we decided to collaborate with. And it's an ongoing piece uh, where we draw these sort of fantasy animals, and uh, they help us assemble them and bead everything. And it's definitely one of our favorite projects. Yeah, we saw it as sort of an underutilized craft, which is um, uh, a lot of what we did as kids was very craft oriented. We've ended up in an art venue, but we have a very high appreciation for craft. And they were making these things that would take them two, three weeks to make, and they'd sell them for like $60 at a tourist market. And we were just sort of going, man, there's so much time spent on this, and the community is so oversaturated with this work that it's totally under um, appreciated. Uh, so uh, our point was to sort of pay these women fairly, put them on salary, collaborate together, and then put it, um, this was specifically for the Cooper Hewitt um, two or three years ago. And the idea was to like give them a voice through this insanely amazing craft um, that they were already doing, but just change the venue. And it was a big success, so it was fun. And I think you can start seeing a theme here where our pieces are somewhat functional, but also very much not functional. And uh, that's the gray zone where we've existed for a long time. There's benches in here, uh, and then those giant mushrooms, which are about seven feet tall, are meant for indoors. They're not necessarily for shade or anything, but we just really wanted to make them. Uh, and we've sort of flourished in the, in the gray zone. Uh, I'll move to the next slide. Some more details. These ones were, uh, we named them toys, but they're just uh, fantasy creatures. We were really excited about the textures that we got on them. We, when we went to South Africa, we spent about six months there just sort of experimenting with beads and uh, creating textures uh, and tried to incorporate them as much as possible. More of those guys. More of those. This is at Marianne Boski Gallery, right down the street. Uh, this is one of our most recent works. Nikki is an incredible sculptor. He, he does a sort of cartoonish, uh, super expressive, uh, amazing way of getting life and humor across just through sculpting. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Uh, um, we made a, a, a tableware set for a, a good friend and client of ours, and it was all based in hands. So the idea is like all the silver and stuff, you would grab the handle, and you're actually like grabbing the hand of a beast. And then all those beasts were put into this holder where the hands are like sticking out, so it's sort of like a beast zombie graveyard that then becomes this like functional object afterwards. Um, I think this is just a play on that. They originally started as like table table candle holders, and then uh, uh, making them larger sort of makes them absurd. It, they're totally impractical in terms of them being like a functional object. 
Um, they're very much sculptural, but at the same time, I guess they're pseudo-functional. So as everything that we make, it's always sort of half and half, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. These Some are seats. <laughs> more details of this is also inside Boski Gallery. This um, is sort of a nod to, or like homage to Pedro Friedberg, because we're such big fans of his work, and he made that awesome hand chair. And he's also somebody that, that made design that could be considered art, could be considered design, so. The absurdity, <coughs> absurdity continues with the many extra fingers, which I love, uh, and they're kind of going like this. Uh, this is also inside Marianne's gallery. Uh, a lot of these objects were uh, most well known for. So the furry pieces we call beasts, and they're sort of character studies that Nikki sculpts. Uh, the fur is Icelandic sheepskin that we source in Iceland. Nikki discovered it on a trip there and was super inspired by it. Uh, and uh, all of the horns on those animals were carved by our father, who taught us how to carve stone as kids. And then the, the light fixtures in the back, I don't know if you can tell they're light fixtures, but they, they turn on. If, if you go down to the, to the gallery just down the street, you can see them at night. And uh, the, the, they're not cast bronze, they look like it, but Simon created this very intense material that we call hextile that's basically bronze mosaic, uh, not bronze, brass mosaic, and it's uh, tiles are about a quarter inch thick. Um, and they're each hand bent and placed and there's thousands of tiles per each of these and each tile takes 15 to 20 minutes to, to place then they get carved and then ground down so it's a really good example of how Simon and I work together where Simon is a um, obsessive material uh, researcher where he's inventing all types of weird things that have never been done before and then I'm so lucky to get to sort of express them in sculptural form um, on top, I don't know if you can tell, but there are these really beautiful uh, glass f uh, sort of floret flowers um, that are made with uh, these this very simple uh, programs that Simon created uh, where uh, uh, you can take a, a rod of borosilicate glass and melt it and almost spin it like in the way that a 3D printer would but with a human hand. So they all end up slightly different. They look like coral. Um, you kind of got to go check it out to tell what we're talking about. It is hard to tell, but I love taking sort of um, processes from computing, actually, and running them through my own head and then acting like a computer myself, and then just plot away at doing something. Uh, and those shades are a really good example of it. Um, but yeah, I would encourage you to see them in person. Um, this is another view of that. A great beast. I love this guy. Uh, if you like Roger Rabbit, there's like the wolf in the audience is like, slapping his foot and his tongue rolls out on the, <laughs> we're, we're very inspired by cartoons, so it's like, there's lots of cartoon work and a lot of this stuff. I think the idea is that um, cartoons, humor, and sex uh, are a very quick way to someone's heart. You can have a very, uh, very fast conversation with a stranger. If you're, if you're, I don't know, at a party and you don't know each other and you crack a joke, you're very immediately more intimate and then you can start to have empathy for the other person. So, we think of these objects sort of as, um, I don't know, our language in a sense. So it's a way that we can start a conversation with people. Uh, and then this one sort of feels like it's sort of a joke, like a cartoon, but it's like very meticulous behavior with lots and lots of thought behind it. And then ultimately, it can open a much more heady conversation. But that's really, I think, the goal of what we're trying to achieve is that, you know, a five-year-old kid can walk up to this and be like super stoked about it. But then also, you know, an older museum curator that's maybe a little bit, uh, you know, over it, been doing it for a long time, can get into the conversation and get turned on by the, by the, by the, uh, the, 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 the concept of it as well. And we love the idea that people would develop sort of an emotional attachment to these things. And I think that they do. Anyone who owns one uh, will always tell us about it, which makes me so happy. Uh, give us yeah, like a status update. Uh, <laughs> uh, these are some ceramics. These are our new ones. One. Uh, this is one of my favorite processes. It is, um, we call it accretion. And it's a process where we, we build this sort of like an artificial cave uh, where it is layer by layer by layer. Uh, we brush on very, very wet clay. It's called slip onto the surface of the vessel, let it dry, brush it again let it dry, brush it again. Hundreds of layers, sometimes thousands of layers, and the surface, that sort of furry surface, actually grows off of the surface. 
This is um, another process Simon created, and just to give him a little bit of credit, it's like um, ceramics is a very old, old, old uh, uh, craft, and it, there's very seldom new breakthroughs, and this is something that is like unusual in the ceramics com community. So it's like this has been a fun pro you know, process for us because um, it opened the door to a craft community that we were previously uh, not very connected to. Um, and he created it within a week of working in ceramics. That's what's great about the way Simon's brain works is it, he can come into a process super naive and, and uneducated about it, but see a material's potential immediately uh, and create something that, that no one else has thought of before, Thanks. which is great. I can't talk myself. Right. Uh, these, but, we, uh, these also, they started out as vessels a long time ago. They were just tubes. Um, but you can see that, that a couple of them have actually been capped off, and we really, they're not usable at all in their quality sculpture. Um, this is a close up of that process. Uh, on this one, this one's been fired three times. So we do a bisque fire, and then we will put a glaze on just the tips, fire that, and then we put a gold over glaze and fire the tips one more time. Um, so that these ever make it from uh, from the from being wet to actually getting out of the kiln and being shipped is sort of a miracle. And in that sense, I think these objects are really precious. They just capture so much time and so much care. Um, and to me, that's a beautiful. More details of those. Here's those with uh, as a, a little collection. Some of the objects uh, are little tiny versions of the beasts, and then a few of the other ones are our, our newest process, uh, which is a more logic-based way of building with clay. So we still go layer by layer, but we apply um, we apply each layer with a tiny pipette, and according to some rules that I've written down about how the lines need to wiggle around or um, I can't really describe that without <laughs> yeah. it for you, but yeah. it is logic based and that's one of the things I'm the most obsessed with. Uh, that's a good example of one. Yeah. Um, you can see that there's a twist happening in them that is, um, that is an example of, of uh, logic. And behind that, there is, I just have, a, I have this feeling that everything will self-organize if you do one thing the same way over and over and over, a shape can come out. Uh, if you just lay a rule down and follow it. And in my experience, it's true, and these are an example of that. More of those guys? So all of these are at Busky, and I, uh, it's right across the street, so it's pretty easy to get to see. This is also at uh, There's a fireplace there that's carved from stone. Uh, we, we, uh, we grew up as stone carvers, so it's like really fun to like get back into doing stone again. Like since we were ten or eleven, our dad uh, it was a mason, so we did like countertops and fireplaces and stuff. And uh, we always had this fantasy to use Carrera because in Texas we would use limestone, which is great, but like from a carving standpoint, it's not super tight. There's like soft pockets and stuff. So it's like sort of a, a shitty carving stone. It's beautiful, but um, uh, so like to get to use, this is called Pele de Tigre. It's like the Portuguese version of, of Carrera. Carrera is like very bright white. Uh, Pele de Tigre has these like shocks of black and green and pink going through it. So um, it was really fun to get to get to do that. And then another cartoon reference, I don't know if anybody uh, watches Futurama, but there's a character in it named Dr. Zoidberg, it's like a crab man his lips. with a strange mouth. And it's very much based on his mouth. It's a Zoidberg <laughs> fireplace, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a close-up of that. There's a really big stone bench in the center. Um, that really, it's all about the feeling of it. But when you put your hands on this, it's cool to the touch, and the, the hone is just wonderful. So we, we love to use stone for that. Uh, and then you can see a mirror as well above that has the same sort of thing. Some smaller mirrors. Giant candles and more of the stone series. Uh, the two that are flanking the center one are some light fixtures, and then the, the center one is a bowl or a sink basin. And then we made some huge candles because there's like a fireplace, and it's sort of like you're getting vibey, and like it's the, it's a mix between like a séance and uh, and it's like spot. hanging out at home and relaxing. It's yeah, like yeah. The, <laughs> more stone. I love the set. This is a this is a seating area that is already sort of enjoying.
I saw whether anyone was in there or not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, these guys all have hands uh, and they're kind of crawling around. And then the center table is a six-legged coffee table. It has the same textile process on it that we were talking about earlier. Uh, so the, just to give you a sense of how long that takes, the, the centerpiece took four or five months of just mm -hmm. hammering uh, little metal bits. And it's kind of amazing because in the end it looks like a solid piece of metal and you almost can't tell quite how much work went into it. There's that again. If you stop by Bosky's gallery, you should take a really close look so that you can see the, uh, the hexagonal pattern. This is an older uh, set that we made. It's a giant dining table, and it's a bunch of animals sort of having like a, a dinner. Uh, <laughs> it's like they're having a dinner party before the dinner guests even arrive. <laughs> so. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, okay, that's. This one yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of our names are humorous and uh, have pop culture references. Because she's big and blonde and beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, this one is another hextile piece. It's kicking its back legs in the air. Um, this is, again, just sort of subverting the, the function. The amount of effort it takes to actually make those back legs happen uh, is not quite worth it unless you really want to get something across. And to us, this is one of, it's one of my favorite hextile pieces. It's just so playful uh, and still so carefully done. Some tall stools. These are rugs. Um, we made these in Nepal. And we wanted to make sort of hives of extinct animals. And they're really playful versions of them. There's a dodo bird. There's a specific type of zebra that's extinct. Uh, and I can't remember all of them, but this was so much fun. And you can see Nikki's cartooning come out uh, with these. And most of the time, they're actually on the wall, but they're definitely usable as rugs. The zebra is, is based on the gum fruit stripe. I don't know if you guys remember fruit stripe. <laughs> so we love having these like, yeah, these like dumb cultural references because <laughs> cause that's what really like brought us up, I think, that affected us more than, you know, anything else really. And uh, we, we love this, the play of either pop culture or something as, as silly as fruit stripe gum. And yeah. then, you know, these are all hand knotted rugs. It's really not a simple thing to do. So I just like combining all of those together. Fruit stripe. That's my favorite. This yeah. is crazy. There's a this is a there's a long story behind this. I think this is the last image too, yeah. from what I remember. But like there's a story behind this guy which is like um, uh, Simon and I were had a couple rocky years, we were sort of having a fight and uh, we were working on a show and uh, this guy, all of the beasts are sort of character portraits and there's sort of this like big looming thing in the room between us. Also everyone in our studio is very much a part of our process and our family and uh, there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of difficulty and it was sort of like us sort of being like showing our masculinity, like we can handle this, we're gonna make the biggest, baddest thing we've ever made uh, and it's a lot of weakness in it too, and, but it's beautiful because it's like catching this moment of being like, we have a big gold penis. So, uh, but it's, it's really, it's, it's, uh, it's like, it's a snapshot of a moment of darkness inside of what we were doing. And, and I think it was like an omen of things to come inside of our studio. So it's like, this is one of the pieces for sure that is a bit of a cartoon. It's like nine feet tall, by the way, too, it's huge. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a cartoon, but there's a lot of story behind it, where we were at the time that we made it. And I, I'm really fond of this piece now because it's a marker of really how we found each other as partners, as brothers, again. Uh, and it was sort of this marker of this like place that allowed us to like kind of move on with our career from that point forward, but also as like brothers. So it's, it's a like beautiful a, piece, yeah. It's like a portrait of our, of our very darkest moment. Of our studio. We very briefly broke up at, while we were doing this and uh, have come back together in such a much more beautiful way. Um, and I think that that's the last like ego piece. Right. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and that's been like, such, I think it's such a successful piece. So yeah. That's all of the slides. Yeah.
no. Yeah, that's it. No, that's a good thing. Yeah, totally. Man, I mean, you know, we're twins, so uh, like we've been doing it since we were super, super young. Um, I don't, I don't even know how to like. People have asked us that, and there's sort of like I think different answers that are like anecdotal to different periods of our life. But I remember being like four or five in the backyard, and like I can't remember the artist that made those machines where like a marble goes down and like, yeah, like pops a balloon and then it like spins a wheel that like drops something and like water starts filling a bucket. We would be making those together or like trying to. And then that moved into us, you know, making slippers that we called pussyfoots that were shaped like pussies that you put your feet into. That moved into like being in a band together. And then this, this what we're doing now started, um, we were both, Simon was working in a restaurant, uh, cooking at this like vegetarian place. And I was like a property manager. We'd both been in construction for such a long time that I kind of fell into it. And we were both just like, let's just work for ourselves, even if we're making less money. So we started a cabinet business. So that's really what, that's what this business is. It started as a cabinet business that became weird furniture, that became art, but it also just depends on who you're talking to. That's what's so fun about what we do. It's sort of a mirror in a way. The person that's looking at it really decides what it, purpose it serves. Um, and that's what was so beautiful about it. It was really like this organic process, but our first co collaboration as like the Haas brothers was was making like kitchen cabinets. <laughs> right, I, mean, yeah. I think it's yeah. kind of cool because as soon as we were officially partners, I think the cabinets quickly turned into just our way of uh, we sort of returned to our youth and approached everything in the same playful way that we did then, and that continues through. And uh, I don't know how it's, I think it's rare to discover that rediscover that as an adult and. That's why I think we're, we feel so fortunate to be doing it. Yeah. Okay. So you made reference to, yeah, I guess we should. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you keep okay. that one. So uh, you made reference, Nikki, to, uh, I can't remember the first one, but then you did use the word zombie. Mm -hmm. uh, and my ears kind of popped up because I'm hearing the zombie show. Oh. Uh, so I like these kind of cultural zeitgeist. So yeah. can you talk about zombies and why you're interested? Uh, yeah, well, okay, so George Lindemann is a good friend of ours and he commissioned us to make this like flatware set and his, his only thing was it has to be functional, which to me was really scary because <laughs> we're like, oh shit, it has to work, <laughs> which like sometimes our stuff is a chair, but you don't really sit on it. And, you know, uh, uh, my friend, funny enough, like two nights before we got into it, we were doing karaoke and he karaoke zombie that song, the cranberry song, so sort of just like floating around in our heads and I was like doing sketches and I was just like, what if there's hands and you have to grab the hands and the hands are zombie hands? So that didn't make any sense if you don't know what I'm talking about. I just <laughs> there's a holder that's made out of a hex tile, sort of squatting and it's a flat top and there's all these forks and knives that go down, like blade down into a hole in the top of it. So there's like this walnut sort of field and then all these like cast silver hands sticking out of it that look like zombie hands, like those candle holders down there. And uh, um, yeah, you grab onto the hand. I don't know, zombies are just, like think about it, if you're a kid that grew up in the 90s, zombies were all around. And I think you like, you feel that with a lot of different things right now. Like we're in our 30s and you're sort of starting to be in control of pop culture in a sense, at least you're like the up and comings and you're sort of taking over and you're you know, doing museum talks or like we have friends that have shows on TV or they're like touring the world playing music and it's like just that time where you sort of recycled what it is that felt important to you when you were younger so I think like zombies were just part of our uh, it's like part of the movies I'm bringing I guess they're yeah <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> right I mean, huh. I mean I, I, I don't particularly love zombies but <laughs> um, 
I, I do know that they're on the scale, uh, I don't know if you know the Uncanny Valley, but there's a scale where humans can't relate to something. And zombies are one of the most revolting things that uh, we can experience. Uh, and it actually ties into the beasts that we did because Nikki came to me asking to do, um, wanting to do this fur. And I thought, well, maybe we can talk about the uncanny valley with it. Like, if it's taxidermy, it's revolting kind of on a zombie level, or it's really hard to relate to. If you make it cute, then you can actually start to relate to it, and then it goes it's right back up to being even uh, much nicer. So that's my only zombie reference. But <laughs> well, ultimately, you're, you're like, you're eating with a zombie hand. That's yeah. so cool is you can take something like a zombie that's disgusting and awful, yeah. or taxidermy that is, is cool. I think it's cool, but like some people hate it. And it's like, make it funny by adding personality and like cartoon to it. It's like you diffuse all these issues inside of a venue that there's no real just, you know, like discourse necessarily. Like everyone sort of agrees it's a fantasy and that allows you to create empathy and then get somebody's ear and then ultimately you can talk about, you know, like the proverbial zombie uh, in, in, I don't know, just like everyday life, right? Like if somebody's gay and you grow up somewhere where that's not okay or whatever, like if you utilize um, humor around it, you can create an idea that makes it more acceptable. I think it makes it way. That's where my head's <laughs> when I'm thinking about it. Maybe it's making it too many, but. No, actually, I mean, for me, the zombie reference is, is about the idea of the kind of liminal state between, like, being, you know, dead and undead or awake and, you know, asleep, right? And so it fits in with your whole idea of the gray area, right? And I think for a long time, there's been a culture of either or, right? Like you have to choose, like, mm -hmm. you're either this or that. I think now there's potentially the opportunity to embrace the both hands, mm -hmm. right? And so I like guess the original Raya, right? Like it's a story. It's not real. It's about people that really did exist, but they were turned into zombies. I, I can't remember the exact reason. Like they were up at night, and they, you know, or a witch or a Dracula, whatever it is. They're all stories about real people that have been turned into propaganda, basically, to turn people against them. So I don't. Know. And I mean, as for the the gray area. Um, I think it is, it is sort of human nature to categorize things. Even Nikki was telling me his son is starting to understand categories. He's seven, eight months old. Mm -hmm. um, and it is it's part of our nature, and I think when something goes outside the bounds of a category, it can be totally terrifying, but it's also like really captivating. Um, so I like That's that. That's where the opportunity is, right? Mm -hmm. It's true. And that fits in, I mean, even the introduction to your work, the idea that it, it blurs the boundaries between art and design, right? And so for people that want you to be one thing, then it makes them uncomfortable, or for people that want you to be the other thing. But if you can be both and, uh, then that's where the, the potential for that kind of transformative influence comes in. Exactly. The gray area is a lot bigger than the, the poles. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, you talked about having a lot of rules and actually having them written down. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about that, because I think a lot of people have these sort of unwritten rules, like, well, I always do this, or I never do that. Uh, what, what is so um, like significant and like, uh, like un, not, I don't want to say inflexible, but you know, like where can you not compromise, right? So like, what are the written rules and how strong are they? Um, they're, they're really based on nature and natural processes. If you have uh, a set of conditions like gravity and a slope, and you introduce, uh, there's a block of ice, and you introduce heat, it'll melt and carve out a river, and the river is really based on uh, just the particular uh, conditions that are there. And in nature, there's a set of rules that nobody can really see necessarily, but I just have a sense that it's there. And I think that um, inside of a set of rules, you are able to generate some of the most outrageous uh, forms. And there's only so far that, that my mind can go if I'm actually contriving a shape and trying to make, make something that I want, or if I bring in any decorative elements, that's where I draw the line. I want to write a rule that generates something that, that I, I sort of set the rule off like a seed, and then I have no more to me, that is the material sort of living a life of its own. So it's a productive rule rather than a restrictive rule. Definitely. 
uh, and productive, and it involves sometimes, as is the case with those glass pieces, you can program uh, a building roll, you know, layer by layer circles, and then you can program in a, a depth roll also, which has just as much to do with form building. Um, and if that's, a, that's a mirror of, of sort of biological processes. So I am approaching building very much more from a fascination with science. I'm not a scientist, but I, I am I'm a hobby scientist, and, and, I, and I, I just love material science. Okay. Do you have rules too? I, well, our rules inside the stu like as, as far as like the studio goes, there are some like philosophical guidelines. I think they're not quite as written, but there's definitely like I know there's like a couple like if if we get offered a project, there's like three things where two of three need to be satiated. So it's like, um, uh, are, is it going to be fun? Is it going to uh, make our voice bigger or like advance the career? And then number three, are we helping people? So if we're like having fun and our career is getting bigger, great, we'll do it. If we're having fun and we're uh, helping people will do it. Um, so there's definitely like some things in place like that for sure. But building wise, no rules. Right? Building wise, no rules. Yeah. I mean, we just like you know, yeah, we do whatever we want, which is why we're so lucky. We like really dick around in our studio and, and do. I mean, we work really hard, but we like have so much fun and we get paid to do it, which is pretty pretty amazing thing to get to do. Yeah. So. So you reference this idea of fun, and obviously humor is in your work as well. Um, so, are there what knowing that? What do you take the most seriously? Uh, our construction, and I think, and then also like our uh, utilizing our uh, like the gift of this career in a way that feels like it's important in some way, even if it's just to small groups of people. Um, there's lots of people that work in creative realms that I think really drink their own Kool Aid. I think we were going down that path for a second too. King Dong, right? That big, that big furry thing with the dick is sort of like a, like a. Uh, that's us at the height of drinking our own Kool Aid, right? Uh, and uh, um, yeah, I think that that for sure, um, the strictest rule to me is that we feel like we're putting effort into what it is that we're doing uh, and giving it our very best shot always. Because um, I know people personally that end up with the immense privilege of getting to do creative work um, for a living and uh, they sort of cop out or they like just streamline in one direction to like make it more profitable maybe which is totally understandable I totally get it but um, I think for us we are like hyper dedicated to our craft and we feel like we're so lucky to get to first of all have it be a job and also sell it at the price that we're selling it at that we're not going to like half-ass something uh, we're really, really, really pedantic about making it as perfect as possible. Um, and then the other rule is like, I think our, our studio, our employees, um, the way that they're treated, there's a lot of small unwritten rules about the way that that works, but um, I, I think like we just don't want to lose sight of what it is we're doing or like the fact that we're so lucky to get to do it. So, right? Wouldn't you say? I don't know. No, I think I take craft the most seriously yeah. and then also um, fairness if we're working with, with other artists uh, I think is a really, really big deal. Uh, we don't hire fabricators and ignore them. Um, and then in a broader sense, I take uh, the natural order really, really seriously. <laughs> yeah, so you talked a little bit about the um, female beaters in South Africa and seeing that they had something that was a value that they couldn't really assign that value, economic value to themselves um, in their community or whatnot. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the other work that you do? Because you do do a lot of work to empower other people. We do. And at Cape Town, was, it was a very difficult project. But um, we just we saw, uh, we saw them working in post-apartheid South Africa and just seeing. Uh, I related to them a lot because my personal process is equally tedious, um, and I just thought, uh, you know, they could have a bigger platform. Um, it came with its own pitfalls, and we're still trying to work that out, but it has actually moved us forward to starting a project that I am incredibly excited for, that's also beadwork. Um, but we have brought a, uh, I have another rule-based system, but it's all about beads, and we brought it to Central California, uh, actually at the request of Linda Resnick, who 
um, is really dedicated to improving the livelihood of women in her farming communities. And she said, why don't we try to do something similar out there? So we are lucky enough to get to go work with them, and we currently have a, a team of 17 women who are all working for themselves, and I put in an order for something and they make it, and they're bringing home more money than their husbands, and they're all just like really loving their jobs, and I think of anything that I've gotten to do personally, it's the most satisfying. Do you want to add to that? Uh, no, that's yeah. <laughs> so, there was a, in, an opinion piece written by Dave Edwards in the New York Times this week that was about the ability to, um, what was about the absence of artists um, in uh, having currently come to the White House and talking about how prolific um, both George W. Bush and Ronald Reagan were in terms of bringing artists and musicians and poets and collaborative people to the White House. And the point of the article was about uh, the ability of art to instill empathy. So uh, you guys mentioned empathy a couple times. Can you talk about how you think art does um, read empathy and, and without seeming like it's an obvious question, sometimes it's really important to state the obvious, like why is that matter? I think it matters a lot. And there's, it's really hard to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And I think everyone in here has probably been through a moment that is incredibly difficult. Artists have, the, the luxury and also the, the burden of expressing their own internal difficulties uh, or happinesses into objects or pictures that are really pal palatable by another by an audience. And I know that I have had moments where something in my head, uh, like something clicks in my own brain that I've never considered just because I'm looking at an object. I think that. I think that objects and pictures have had incredible significance to us throughout history and it's part of our makeup. Um, and to, uh, to set it aside as sort of like a, uh, like a fun little thing to do, I think is, is sort of sad. You know, I, I, and I've also watched just through, because we teach children sometimes, um, and in the case of the South Africa or the Lost Hills projects, um, I've actually watched um, craft and creation transform people's way of feeling about themselves. It's, uh, it adds so much self-esteem and so much pride in having produced an object. And humans just love having objects. It's a, an important thing. Yeah, uh, empathy is so massively important. I was on the same folk in a sense. Um, I think like, like you look at art, um, and, and I think like generally creative, uh, work and I don't know, I think like you referenced in the 90s, there was a big moment of sort of um, uh, uh, appropriation, or you look at like music and it's like grunge and sort of like fuck the world, uh, more like uh, going into your own head and sort of like romanticizing this idea of like, fuck everything, blah, blah, blah. The world now is moving into this place where um, despite the, I think the current uh, uh, like social and political uh, climate, which is like can be depressing at times. Um, when you're teaching kids, which we've been doing a lot, um, I, I remember like I sat down with these kids in, in Austin, and they're like all underprivileged kids that got to work through the museum there, uh, and they actually like have a board and they get to like make decisions at the museum, which is super cool. But they're like 18, 20, and um, I sat down and I was just like. We had a project in mind where we do like an exquisite corpse kind of thing, and I was just sort of like, do you guys want to do exquisite corpse, or do you just want to like ask me any question you want because I'm a professional and this is what I want to do at some point? And like, we just want to ask questions. Um, and then it became this like we're talking back and forth, and I was like, well, what do you guys want to do with your life more than anything? And overwhelmingly, I'd say 90% of them, their answer was like, find a way to help my community and progress what it is that we're doing and make the world usable for everybody. Um, whereas, like, I mean, man, if I think about us at like 18 and 19, and like people we went to high school with, and like, I want to be a lawyer and make so much fucking money and blah, 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 this and that, which is cool too. And that's, that's you know, that's the, their, that, you know, a lot of them did do that, which is great. And I think now turn it around and like use the power of what it is they created for themselves. But the world is moving into a place of reinvestment. And I think art too, like, um, I've been talking about the 90s and grunge and appropriation and all that stuff. Now it's about generative art, it's about making things that come fully from fantasy. And inside of fantasy, you can create 
these dichotomies between different things, right? Like you can you can poke at something political, or you can bring up ideas that are maybe faux pas or hard to discuss, and inside the realm of what we do, make somebody somebody empathetic to the message that you're creating without them even knowing what they're being empathetic about. It's sort of like a Trojan horse in a way. And no one else really has the power to do that except creatives. So in a way, it's like, it's very much our duty to do that. Not that artists that don't do that are like out of touch because it's, it's all about provoking thought. And ultimately, like the Grunge Fuck You thing is like bringing a whole different type of discussion that does help people understand themselves. But um, yeah, empathy is hugely important. If you don't understand other people as an artist or if they don't understand your art, there's no point to it really. An art, artist is made by their audience, not by themselves. Like, there's even people that have died and that later their work gets rediscovered and becomes hugely important to huge groups of people. And that's all because of um, the perceived empathy, the idea that they have something in common and that they feel like their artist is talking to them. Like if you've ever listened to a love song and you feel like that person wrote it about you, they did, totally didn't most of the time. Sometimes they might, they might have it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But they were good in understanding humans and understanding that empathy existed. And I don't think writing a song or making a good art piece is, is really any different. So like empathy, not only is it the key to sort of like creating great work, I think it's like, it's, it's one of the only reasons to even be making work in the first place. You know? Like in a grand scheme, right? In a philosophical sense. So. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea of being a service to your community and however you define your community and whatever that means is something that I'm really optimistic about with uh, with what we can do but also you know with young people I right? like 16 17 people who are coming into their home and figuring out you know, what they want to do and yeah your son's probably in his 20s now right 17 17. Oh, this is not as long ago as I remember. We both play ice hockey and we're both like goalies, which is cool. But it's like, I bet you that's where he's at. But I bet that's where his head is at, right? He's probably thinking about how he can help the world. And I mean, that's not that, just to be totally honest, it wasn't what I was thinking about when I was 17. I was thinking about, like, I want to have a music career and like, have people look at me on stage and shit, which is totally. I mean, I think that's why, too. I'm on stage, you know? So, uh, you talked about cartoons, humor, and sex as, like, the three things that can kind of break things down. So, and um, the idea of telling a joke and, and bringing that kind of intimacy. Do you have a go-to joke that you have? Yeah, just put a big dick on a sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is what kind of vegan is milk? Everybody knows this one probably. What kind of vegan is milk? A booby. <laughs> a booby. Sorry. It's a really, it's a, no, but I, my jokes are, I tend to, I like to make puns. Uh, so I, I'm, I, I love to just quickly make a pun on the fly about something. Yeah. Uh, my go-to joke is, um, what's brown and sticky? <laughs> I love that joke. <laughs> uh, okay, why don't we open it up to some questions? Yes, sir. What's the uh, substrate you have in the, the brightest times? Ah. So the, the question was, I'll just read this. Uh, what's the substrate underneath the brightest times? Uh, it's steel and a, a steel reinforced epoxy resin. So it's a very stable material. It's awesome, it's called epoxy sculpt. You should buy it, it's really great. And it's, um, the only thing is wear gloves because I got sensitized to it, and if I touch it, I basically like, break out and poison ivy. But it's an amazing material. Not to wear like, a full hat to that suit, but I'm using it, so it's great. Yeah, a lot of our materials are sourced from, because we're in LA, we, we get to go to all the different film studio um, supply warehouses, and we just test all the materials and see what they've got. So that's one of the ones that we found there. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> Just in terms of the order of evolution of the work, does the material come first and then you come up with the, the piece or the vision or the drawing or the character after? Or do you have an image of a character that you then want to execute in a certain material? 
That's a good question. Does the material come first or the form, basically? Or the, the content? Um, the material is such a slow process. I'll be working on the material for one or two years, and the key works very quickly, and the forms are um, pretty much exclusively generated by him. So I think when it, once I've fully developed a, a material, we can have an idea that's based on it, but um, for the most part, I think the sculpture comes first, when you say? No, I feel the other way around. Oh. <laughs> I feel like, I mean, maybe both, because Simon creates the material, and then, like, I get the privilege of getting to, like, run wild with it. You know what I'm saying? So, like, the hex tile, for instance, I, I didn't make any of those forms until he's like, check this red tile form. He actually created the first form for that, and I was just, now I get to go, wow, what's cool with hex tile on it? And it's, like, all kinds of stuff. It's great. Yeah, like, with the athletes, that came out of the, the women who had the beating, how do you decide what images to send them to make? Yeah, that was that, that's a good question. That was really fun. So with the Afriks, the women were truly involved in in the making of it. Some of you commissioned Afriks here, you know that they don't totally look like what the drawing you looked at, you know, eventually. And the reason is that we, we just drew a bunch of crazy forms and then uh, we would talk about it with them and they'd be like, this color's horrible, I like this form way better. Um, and uh, so yeah, the beating came first, and then we created the drawings, and then it was just a discussion. And it's kind of like that with me and Simon, too. Like, if I draw something or he draws something, we'll talk about it, we'll sort of edit each other. We both come up with so many ideas that, like, editing is really, like, a very important process, I think, in our studio. So which ones we decided to make it was sort of like a group effort. It wasn't just the two of us being like, this is the idea, and you make this exactly. It was more of like, like, what is, what is everybody vibing with the most? It helps us reach that moment of empathy again, too, right? If a group of people bring on something, there's a chance that it's going to appeal to more on a deeper level than, than just somebody being like, this is perfect and I know best. So. And, I mean, with the, with the Afriks, too, uh, uh, you were sitting and drawing with them, and as they were making it, they were like, what am I making? But they were laughing and they really loved it, and I think that was a sign that it was the, the right time to form. That was a it was. But then as far as like the, we have so many materials that we never use that we'll never see the light of day. We just like constantly make more of them. So there's, we kind of have a bank of them. And, and I think that Nikki will conceive of an object and, and decide which parts might work for what. So. All right, well. Yes. What, are, what artists have inspired you or whose artist's work do you sort of Look uh, at a lot. What artists have inspired us? I'm the most inspired by David Hockney, uh, particularly the way he writes about his own process. Um, uh, really sort of opened the door for me to be able to, to do exactly what I feel like. Uh, he talks about not being afraid to use the word pretty, for example. He calls his own pictures pretty, and um, I know that that was sort of a oddly taboo at the time that he was doing it. Um, and it made me think that it is, it's okay to, uh, to express yourself how you want to and describe your own work in the way that you want to. And so he's, he's really my biggest inspiration. I really like Nikki Santal. Uh, he is known as Phil Custon Santal Mui Kusama. Those are my favorites, I'd say, for sure. Because they're real, like, they seem like real fantasies. You know what I'm saying? They're totally, like, coming out of left field. There's nothing about it really that feels like appropriated or it really feels like it just fully comes out of their brains and you're like, where the fuck did that come from? That's the kind of art I'm going into. Yeah. We just talked a lot. Yeah. 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 No, I'm just kidding. Well, you just used the word appropriated again and I've, like, I've noticed it once or twice and I'm just kind of noticing that you work with like international communities a lot but so many of your references seem very American. Like what was it like to work with Nepalese artists on like a juicy fruit drop. You know, and I'm just wondering if you see your like Americanness as something to manage or yeah. you know how, totally, how, how that works. Totally. And like Nepal is a it, that, that was like more of a um, less of a collaboration that was more of like a like we were outsourcing and ability. Like we visited the school and the community was amazing. But like really Africa is a great example of of that and like our Americanness. I think we came in and wanted like yeah, we're American and we get it and like we're gonna bring money to the community and we're gonna like totally change everything about everything in South Africa. 
And then the reality is you go there, and a lot of stuff that African really knocked us on our ass about our ambitions, which I think was, was good to go there with some, like, I mean, ambition about what it is that we could achieve, and I think we really did do a lot of good, but it was, it was focused to a specific group of people, which is great. And then the story becomes this really big, beautiful thing. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, like, like, uh, like working with the women was, um, uh, it, it was collaborative. And I think that's important inside of the work that we do, is that we need to understand where we're coming from, right? Like our Americanness, and then understand that we have a lot to learn. Um, they taught us so much about what it is that we do. The project in Central Valley is teaching us so much about what it is that we do. And ultimately, everybody that we work with it becomes this big collaborative process changes very much the way our studio works. So it's like, it could be called appropriation on some level because we're sort of like adopting an African aesthetic and the work that we're making. But um, where I'm coming from, my, my viewpoint, and I think Simon feels this too, it's about everyone throwing their hand in the pot and coming out with something where like, we talked about it and came up with an idea. Like, if you hire somebody to make your work, or if you create a venue in which you can make stuff, it's sort of like a romantic relationship. Either like one person can just be doing their thing and you have like a set of rules and it's like very sterile and there's not a lot of like back and forth, or you can um, make a lot of compromises and I think ultimately make a deeper uh, relationship that blooms into having a real product and results outside of it that makes everyone ultimately happier in the end rather than it just being sort of like a setup thing. Does that make sense? You know, but we were super American. There's a lot for us to learn. That's for yeah, I mean, I feel like our aesthetic is definitely American, and because it's so influenced by American cartoons, etc. But I really like to see something filtered through somebody's eyes if they translate it uh, in a way you still get the kernel of Americanness with this extra layer of I'm not really sure what it is. Um, and I think that's a very special quality. And to talk about David Hockney again, I think it actually sort of shows up in his work. When he came from uh, the UK to LA, he was so excited by the light in LA that it became a huge point of focus for him. And I think he actually appreciated it more than most people who live in LA appreciate it. Um, and there's something about seeing Los Angeles filtered through the mind of a, somebody who grew up in Great Britain um, that, is, uh, that makes it an added layer of specialness. So I think that idea of the balance between or the marriage between the you know, I get it, I know what it is, and I really have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that you guys are really great at. And I think that um, that ability to both give pleasure but also to confuse mm -hmm. uh, is something that we need more of. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.